This week on the Computer Chronicles, part two of our special series on technology and the church. We'll show you how some religious organizations are using computers and multimedia to bring new energy into their meetings and services. We'll look at a powerful online business management tool called NetLedger, part of the new Oracle Small Business Suite. And we'll show you how to find the answer to almost any question online, a great research tool for nonprofits called Ask Jeeves. Technology and the Church, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by PC to PC, the online computer migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one. Additional support is provided by Upside Events, presenting the Digital Lifestyle Revolution Conference, where people and technology intersect. Hi, and welcome to this special edition of the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. This is part two of our series on technology and the church, looking at ways that religious organizations and other nonprofits can use technology, computers, and the internet to better run their organizations. Last week, we looked at desktop video and web design. This week, we're going to focus on nonprofit business practices, online educational research, and multimedia. And we're going to start by looking at how some religious organizations are actually integrating technology into their services. To do that, we turn to our first guest, Dan Burke, who's director of multimedia for the Menlo Park Presbyterian Church. And Dan, actually, you do this stuff. You are a video media specialist with mm -hmm. the Menlo Park Presbyterian Church here mm -hmm. in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, let's back up from video for a second. We'll get back to video in a minute. You're sure. using... Uh, just lovely things you've shown me before, like graphics and PowerPoint presentations and things to really enhance a church mm -hmm. service. Uh, first of all, give us an example of the kinds of things you've created for your church, Dan. Well, um, from this example, basically, I've prepared for you. I put together a compilation of some things that we use on a regular basis and sort of put it together in a, a custom show that they just for this so Okay, you know, so what are we looking at here? Basically, this is a stained glass window from the interior of our, sh of our church that has been photographed. And we you took a digital photograph of the windows? Actually, we do now, but these are actually from two or three years ago. Really? We so you can take an old-fashioned film photograph? Scan them into a okay. scanner, pump them into the program, and go on. Um, and then because it kind of keeps the continuity of the interior of the church alive and whatever. And then we'll have our songs that we'll, people will be singing with, the worship band will be leading. So that you'd actually be projecting these things Absolutely. during the service? Two big screens right up in the front of the stage and a lot of monitors, okay. 20 monitors in, in and around the, the building or whatever. Um, and then basically we'll blur out the back of the slide so you can make read the, the mm -hmm. words better and all. And then we'll just, uh, as, the, as the choir and as the uh, worship leaders are leading, we'll just funnel through the, the songs. And then we got to make sure we get our tag up at the very end in relation to uh, mm -hmm. licensing agreements and all that type of stuff. We'll go to maybe a default slide and maybe there's a moment of silence or there's an idea where there's uh, some sort of announcement in transition. Then we'll move on to perhaps on Saturday night, we have a children's program. Oh, and you actually created this whole thing yourself, too, because that's very Well, this nice. is actually out of a, no, it's actually out of a book illustration. Okay. And they were reading from. And we would put maybe the illustrations from the book up on the But big you were screen. able to capture that, put it inside the computer presentation, again, project it on the big screen. Yes. And this is all scripted and planned for the rest of the night. Perhaps another transition. Um, and then we'll maybe get to the scripture reading section. We'll have uh, the scripture reference mm -hmm. and where it's at, and actually the, the page number huh. in the Pew Bible, if they want to go. And then we'll just have it on front screen for them to read. Um, one nice thing about this, the way we do this, as you'll notice, we'll lead the, the reader to the next, to the next um, mm -hmm. line of it as it's grayed out in the back. It's good for continuity and keeping the, the um, whole scripture section sure. going and moving. And then the, perhaps we'll have a special section oh, that's for, um, this I believe is a church ra raising in um, Rwanda. We'll have a special segment where mm -hmm. missionaries or some crews will go in there, or maybe um, an orphan from uh, mm -hmm. from Mibnoi outside of Moscow named Misho. I've visited him three or four times. Um, and then perhaps we'll do a, a, a Habitat for Humanity in yeah. Palo Alto. These are different segments that the people can bring in and show during um, their little time slot in the middle. We also have the sort of the showcase pieces, which are these choir numbers. Mm -hmm. And then we'll integrate graphics that uh, graphics and song uh, lyrics that relate specifically to the choir as they're singing along. And notice you can change the backgrounds as we've prepared mm -hmm. these sort of special um, template slides that relate to this, yeah. this whole process. Um, 
All right, a couple of questions I would have for you, Dan. First of all, explain the benefit of this. I mean, what does this add to your church or service that you've created things like this as opposed to sort of the more old-fashioned, less sure. tech techy way? Well, it's first of all, our program is totally integrated with media, and it's totally scripted, too. There's not much leeway. It's a very uh -huh. tight program, 50 minutes, and everything's written and planned for. And so basically that works well with media. It's hard to do media on the fly sure. and just zip around wherever you want. Um, we have a linear slide presentation. We started at slide A and go yeah, to Z. Yeah, yeah. Um, but basically people are used to, get used to actually using the big screens and the imagery right. as what they're following for the service. That's we what I want to ask you. What kind of reaction do you get from the members of your of your church about this? They say, boy, I like this. It's better. It makes it more exciting. It makes it more interesting. What? Well, now they're totally used to it. Without it, they, they, they're <laughs> looking for it. But uh, this is a traditional sort of church and it's been around for hundreds of years. The, when we first introduced this technology, the older members were not happy. <laughs> you know, it took a while to ramp them up to. to well, I bet the younger place. members thought this was very cool. Totally, yeah. Normal. Yeah. The later generations are used to seeing imagery sure. as a part of what we're sure. daily of art. A couple so. questions I want to ask you on how hard it is to do this. I mean, your church obviously has a video media specialist like mm -hmm. you to do this. Many churches uh, don't have that luxury. Again, if I'm just a volunteer or a normal person, what tools we're we using? What software we're we using to create? Uh, these, these beautiful graphics? Well, primarily we use Photoshop. Photoshop is the industry standard, Adobe Photoshop. For all our image manipulation, we can do filter effects, we can do a lot of But you of mentioned things. like softening up the backgrounds. Could you like very sure. briefly show us, uh, I know we don't have time to, to do a whole sure. Photoshop demonstration, but, Let me but how you would do some of these things. Just a, the effects you created were just lovely. Well, this last, this last image I just showed up was basically um, this idea of a, a of sort of a background template for this whole series. You have the original picture, we can see how this all started um, out. Well, basically, it started out. It out, starts out something like, like this. Basically, this is how the original image that I started with started from. Uh -huh. Okay, and then basically through a, a, a series of cutting and pasting in different parts of, like for example, this image. Okay, so that I, was the picture, and then you took that and made it into this lovely background. And I by chopped off it part up. of this one, and then I chopped out another part of this background and put it in. These parts of this picture will actually be integrated with the rest of the presentation uh -huh. in different sections. So it kind of makes the whole uh, presentation consistent. Yeah. Now, Dan, some people think Photoshop is a very difficult program <laughs> to use. This is like a baby version of it that people could use. It isn't quite so complicated. Yeah, Adobe Photoshop Limited, LE. The LE okay. versions are cheaper and they're... How much does it cost to buy that? Geez, off the top of me, I'd say under 200 bucks probably, yeah. something like that. And a normal person could figure out how to use that. Yeah, it takes a time to ramp up. A lot of people have some hard time But you don't have to be a graphic artist. But you, yeah. Yeah. All right, finally, in terms of the presentation itself, what kind of software do you use there? Is it like PowerPoint or something like that? Well, actually, we're using a program called Astound, um, and we're actually in the process of looking for new software. We had, we're at a Mac platform based church, uh -huh. and there's not a whole lot of Mac presentation out there beside PowerPoint. And actually, we like, a, we needed a really clean dissolve. So um, we actually used Astound because it was very stable for many years. Now that the company's gone out of business, actually, we're in the... <laughs> You're moving into PowerPoint. Well, actually, no, we're, we're in the process of looking for a whole new series of oh, softwares okay, out there. Okay. And there's a whole... Yeah. There's maybe 15 companies that actually market to churches specifically. All right, Dan, d d just to sum, sum up again, what is the value in, in doing all this? What does it add to your church service? Well, basically, the people... It's, a part, it's integrated fully now with what the people expect on Sunday morning. Um, and they, they want to see it. They it's need engaging. To see it. It's more engaging. And it actually yeah. reinforces what message is, you know, is okay. trying to be... Um, part or shown through structure. Dan, thank you very much. Sure. One of the biggest problems for any nonprofit organization, religious group, or community association is dealing with the day to day business problems of running the organization, paying the bills, keeping track of donations, dealing with staff and volunteers. And the newest trend in solving that kind of problem is the use of an online application rather than the old-fashioned box of package software. Here to show us one such solution is Stephen Wolf of NetLedger, now part of the new Oracle Small Business Suite. And we're talking about managing your money. I mean, if you're running a church, you're running basically a small nonprofit business, and you have to keep track of money in and money out and right. all those kinds of things that anybody else has to worry about. NetLedger's approach is interesting. Let me sort of back up for a minute now. Many people may be using old manual systems, right, where you just wrote in the numbers on exactly a, right. th those <laughs> big green sheets of paper and you hope you, the, the adding machine, you hit, hit the right buttons on the adding machine. Uh, that's not a good idea, right? 
No, I mean, manual systems, paper can get lost, moved around, that sort of thing. Plus all the adding up that you have to do and the mistakes that yeah. can be made. While now, the next that. step, people will go out and buy maybe something like QuickBooks, right? They're off-the-shelf packages you can right. say, hey, you can do all that. Uh, what, what's, what's the upside and downside of doing that? Well, great products. They're inexpensive. They're very, very easy to use, um, which, is, which is nice for a small business person or a, or a church who doesn't yeah. have an accounting background. But um, the downside is, you know, keeping up with the current versions, buying the upgrades, the upgrades and uh, setting it up for multi-user. And it's locked into thing. one particular machine, et cetera. Mm -hmm. well, now, you guys at NetLedger, as we just saw, have a web-based application. We're doing all the accounting tasks you would have to do in a business. Uh, you have it up here, actually. Now, right. how, do, how do I actually use NetLedger? Well, this is actually the NetLedger site that you go to on the Internet, which is netledger.com. Uh -huh. And to set up a company, you just click on Sign Up Now. And it brings you to a sign-up page. And all mm -hmm. they have to do here is fill out the information on the screen and uh, click Submit. Now, I have a company set up already that I'm going to log into okay. to uh, so let's show you what it all looks like. Let's go to the demo account you set up. So, again, it's password protected. So, again, you can control who gets into it. Right. And an important thing, of course, is... Uh, you know, that only authorized people get into the system, mm -hmm. and uh, you don't have people that aren't supposed to be in looking at your books or that sort of thing. Right. So even though it's online and on the Internet, you have security? Yeah, security is an important factor, and it's actually one of the things uh, that businesses ask us a lot about, as you could imagine, when they're thinking about going online. Um, but we're able to do things like get a very powerful and secure database oracle that, that small businesses normally right. can't get. Right. But since we're hosting that application for them, we have the powerful computers, the powerful And database. ironically, in some ways, being online is more secure than having this stuff sitting mm -hmm. on your hard drive. Well, right? exactly <laughs> right. You know, when I talk to, uh, to individuals or organizations and say, do you make backups of your data every day? Do you store the backup off-site? Right, you right. know, those are things that they don't normally do. And, you know, if some emergency happens, a, a fire, fire or, or that something, sort of thing. All, right. all right, so let's see the different kinds of things we can do. Again, we don't have a lot of time, obviously, to do this. But I see some of the, the tasks, the financial tasks you can do there. Walk us through them, Stephen. Right. This is organized around the tasks that you work on. I'm going to go very quick just through these tabs. There's a home page, which is where most people work. And they can set up shortcuts to the tasks that they normally do. There's a transaction tab, and that has all kinds of transactions on here. A reporting tab where you go to do just that, mm -hmm. get the reports and analyze information. And then a list section where you create, uh, you know, set up your members and that sort of thing. So let, let's go through a couple typical things. I mean, you have to write checks if you're running sure. this, right? Can I actually create checks inside mm -hmm. that ledger? You can do it a couple of ways. You can record checks you've already handwritten, and you can also generate checks right out of the system. I choose write checks right off of the screen. And I get a form that's familiar to me. I can pick who I'm writing the check to off of my list. And you'll notice it fills everything out mm -hmm. for me. And then I just type in the amount. And then what account it's, uh, it's going to go to. So this is where the expense is. And uh, we'll just say it's four. Uh, now, one, now, one thing that you want to keep track of if you're a church is your, your income, the donations mm -hmm. that are coming in from various members. Can you track all of that inside something like NetLedger? Right. Well, when you set up these accounts, you can set them up to uh, match what you need for your type of organization. Donations, of course, are a mm -hmm. common type of sure. uh, thing that is being tracked. So you could have businesses. a record for each individual member and be able to track those donations, mm -hmm. for example? Exactly right. And uh, I can show you, actually, on recording donations, Go if ahead. you want, how uh, sure. some of that would work. There's really a couple of ways that people would, uh, would do this. Um, one is I'm recording donations that really a group of people gave me, maybe the collection from the day. Okay. And I'm not recording it to an individual person. And maybe I just set up an a area called collections. And mm -hmm. this is where I'm taking all of the information in. And the method of it was cash. And then I can say, this was my Sunday collections. You can choose that mm -hmm. right from the selection yeah. down here. Enter the amount and hit add. And it will record the uh, transaction for me automatically. So now that's affecting my books showing what sure. I got collections from that type of... Uh, Two thing. other questions. We show sort of basically money in, money out. Sometimes you have to report to your board or something as to how mm -hmm. the business is running. What kind of reports, what kind of graphic representations could I get out of NetLedger? A couple of neat things that people can use. Um, one is we have a number of graphs that give you a snapshot of what you're looking at. Let's just look at income, for example, right now. Mm -hmm. And I can say I want to look at a pie chart, and let's just look at... Uh, let's look at the... Uh, fiscal year to date. Mm -hmm. And I'll hit refresh. And I can see in here 
where all my income has come from. I see most of this is coming from my Sunday collections, but I have donations to a roof fund, the building sure. fund, general fund, right. that sort of thing. So I get quick snapshots. If I wanted to analyze it further, there's detailed reports that I can run again with just the click of a button. And uh, that will show me by individual member sure. what they've donated if I've recorded it that way well, or my total Almost collection. out of time, Stephen. Just a couple of quick questions. This is all, we've been live on the web here. This is all web-based. What mm -hmm. does it cost me to use something like, that, like this? It's nine ninety five per month per user, uh -huh. so it's very inexpensive. There's nothing that the user has to buy to uh, put onto their computer, nothing okay. to install. And that's important for one of the things you talked about earlier. If, if a board member needs to look at information, they can do that right from their home. They don't need to have special Web based, software. so you can yep. access it from yep. anywhere. And you don't, it doesn't matter whether you have a Mac or a PC, as long as you have a, uh, an internet terminal. Right. Another important point for nonprofits, where a lot of times the equipment might be donated. And sure. for them to try to focus on only having a certain type of equipment. It doesn't matter what kind of machine. Right. Stephen, great. Thank you very much. It's Net Ledger. If education is part of the mission of your community organization or religious group, then you really need to know something about using online research tools. Now, a lot of these internet research tools are quite complicated to use, but there are others out there that are very easy to navigate. And one of the easier to use internet research tools is a site called Ask Jeeves. Let me introduce Jenny Dabusco, who is our next guest. She's Director of Research and Analysis for Ask Jeeves, or Ask.com, which is the actual website. Welcome, Jenny. And uh, I want to actually ask you a question. We just had a question before, which is a great example of how you can use the web to find answers to questions. Like Michael Slaughter was mentioning, well, many times you have a question, just go to a website here or there. Mm -hmm. One of the questions was, how do I find out information about what kind of digital video camera to buy or the specs or the, the parameters I, I ought to know? How would you use something like your site, for example, to answer that question? Well, our site is perfect for a question <laughs> like that because we're the question answering service on the web. Okay. So what I would do is I'd go to Ask Jeeves, ask.com, and I'd type in uh, what should I know about digital cameras. So you can just type in a normal English language sentence. You don't have to know any geek stuff. Exactly. Just type in the question as you would just phrase it to me. Okay. And you press that Ask button. And you see that Ask Jeeves brings up a whole group of questions, such as where can I learn about digital cameras, what should I know about digital cameras mm -hmm. before buying one, product reviews, and where you can buy one online, as well as what does the technical term mean. Sure. And suppose you would click through. I mean, where do I actually get the answer? Well, these answers are selected by editors at Ask Jeeves. So there's real human beings that have actually looked at this. Exactly. Stuff. It's and not they found some the machine. Best okay. Exactly. And they found great answers. And so here it looks like it takes us to short courses. And it's the digital photography resource for over 2 million visitors a year. And it's a series. And so there's more than you'd ever want to know about how to buy a digital exactly. camera. Exactly. All right, let's back up a little bit and, and talk about the general notion for people who may not be familiar with searching the web to get answers to questions. Uh, we'll get back up before as.com and as Jeeves. I mean, there are search engines, right? So people would go to a Yahoo or an Alta Vista to, to ask a question, but you'd have to use sort of funny language to do it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is you might get a million responses, right? Exactly. Would you should just give us an example of the typical search environment on the web? Uh, prior to Ask Jeeves? <coughs> yeah. Okay, so prior to Ask Jeeves, there were two types of search engines that people would use. You could use either a, uh, a standard uh, technically based search engine where what that search engine does, like Alta Vista, as you okay. said, would do is it has a crawler that would go out and try to find web pages. So this is just all a machine going out and searching for All keywords. machine, exactly. So you don't know what's going to come back, and it may be totally the opposite of what you're looking for. Exactly. In and then the second type of search engine that existed were directories. Now, what a directory was is it's a search engine that has editors, but what these editors do is they go out and find web pages and then index them under categories. So digital cameras might be found mm -hmm. under an index that's computers, peripherals, cameras, sure. digital. So when you say editor, a person yes, has organized. So that one, but like a Yahoo, for example. Is exactly, that right? Exactly. All right. Now let's talk about As Jeeves and the approach you guys take. So maybe we can get back to the start there. Let, let's talk about a situation in a church environment. Uh, where maybe uh, you want to do some research for a sermon you're preparing for the weekend. You've got to dig up some statistics. Maybe a mm -hmm. teacher in a Sunday school environment trying to prepare a lesson plan for a student. Let's focus it on the context of these sort of uh, religious type topics. How would I go to As Jeeves uh, and get an answer to a question? I mean, suppose I were interested in, uh, I don't know, right now, the history of the Holy Land or the conflict in the Middle mm -hmm. East. We're concerned about that. And I want to get some background so I can include it in my sermon or include it in my, in my uh, class next Sunday. How would I do that? Well, with Ask Jeeves, you would go straight to the site and phrase your question exactly as you wanted. So 
History of the Holy Land. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, right. Type in right. Uh, where can I learn about the history of uh, Jerusalem? Okay. And what will come back is a series of questions. You see this top question. Mm -hmm. uh, when I hit on this bar here, it brings up a series of related topics. So you can see that it's where can I learn about the history of Israeli-Palestinian sure. conflict. It also has the history of the State of Israel, Declaration on the Establishment, the Gaza Strip, Jordan and Israel Peace Treaty, etc. You've also got the history of the country Israel, uh, resources from a, a uh, encyclopedia on it. Mm -hmm. And down here, we also have our uh, direct hit engine has come up with some others, such sure. as main events in the history of Jerusalem timeline. Right, now, suppose I wanted to be like more current, like President Bush is right now talking about faith-based community service programs, and I want to talk mm -hmm. about that in a sermon. How could I dig up the latest information that, that's related to that topic? Well, without G well, I like to think of search engines as being librarians that, uh -huh. that are when you look on the web, it's a gigantic library, and so you might go to say, ask Jeeves as a librarian, because he's easy to talk to, and okay. he usually finds what you're looking for. Uh, for that question, uh, you might want to consider going to a librarian who specializes more in news, okay. like maybe a CNET.com. Okay. But if we were to do it on Ask Jeeves, I'd type in, where can I learn about George uh, W. Bush's policies? What kind of responses he gave back, and you can see that what he's good at doing is he's coming up with information about him as a president. And these are all, you know, all the different sources there you might go to. Exactly. Well, what about something more directly? Suppose I'm looking to buy certain kinds of uh, Christian books or mm -hmm. videos or artwork. Could I use Jeeves for that? Exactly. Where can I buy Christian uh, videos? Okay. And Jeeves searches through and he finds where can I find videos. He's not exactly finding Christian videos. When I go down here, so bringing Bible study and video them. together, children's Christian videos, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, just in a second, you can get answers to these complex. Exactly. We mentioned children. Let me ask you, sometimes we're concerned about children doing this kind of thing and going mm -hmm. on the web directly. What would happen if a, chil a child goes there and says, you know, who is God? Oh, well, we actually. What would happen if they asked a question? I love that? esoteric questions on Ask Jews. <laughs> who is God? So if a child was to go to Ask Jews and ask who is God, we come back. And it turns out that that's a question that a lot of our oh, users ask. Wow. We get over 4 million queries a day. And this is one of the ones that we get. And an editor has gone through, searched the web, and found an answer. And the answer that she selected, and I happen to know this editor, she majored in comparative religions at Berkeley. <laughs> She's come up with an answer where it says, different religions, different beliefs. Mm -hmm. And there, what you get is what faith groups believe about sure. deity. So. Uh, who is God? Well, if you believe that there is no God, right. then that would fit under atheism, uh, that we cannot know whether God exists, agnosticism, etc. Suppo et cetera, et cetera. Suppose I want to do a Bible research, Jenny. What does oh. the Bible say about whatever, marriage or love yeah. or education? Okay, that's another question we get quite often. So what does the Bible say about love? Type that in. And what I get is I get a question with a blank box. Click your mouse. Put the cursor over there, and I'm going to type in, what does the Bible say about love? And Jeeves is going to go to its answer, and looking it up, there we go. All kinds of So it's gone to a there. site that That's does Bible great. searches. All right, so to sum up, the site is ask.com, mm -hmm. and Jeeves is the virtual person out there to answer your questions. Exactly. Jenny, thank you so much. That's it for part two of our special series on technology in the church. We'll have the conclusion of our series next week. If you have any questions about anything you saw on this week's program, please check out our website at computerchronicles.org. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Hope we'll see you here again next week. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by pc to pc the online computer migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one. Additional support is provided by Upside Events, presenting the Digital Lifestyle Revolution Conference, where people and technology intersect. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310 7850. Please specify the show number and the topic. 
Next week on the Computer Chronicles, the conclusion of our special series on technology in the church. We'll show you some simple networking products that can bring added efficiency and cost savings to your organization's business operations. We'll take you to The Rock in Roseville, California, billed as the world's first interactive church. And we'll show you how to add music to your group's events or educational programs with the amazing Vancouverian piano. Technology in the church coming up next week on the Computer Chronicles.